This video is about the cycle that is at the heart of this project. Now, as we had talked about before, a cycle is a repeating pattern of events. And the reason why cycles is important, uh, the concept of cycles uh, and cycles themselves are important, is because the understanding of a cycle and the understanding of the mechanism of a cycle allows us to predict future events. So if we understand a cycle and we know what has just occurred, we can describe what's just occurred and place that in a place on the cycle, we can not only have some approximation of where we currently are, and current observations will show us that even more so we can verify it, but then we can make some predictions on what's coming next. So if we're talking about the seasonal cycle, and we know that we were, it just was snow, and now the snow is starting to melt, and flowers are starting to bloom, we can see, oh, there was winter, we know that spring follows, I'm seeing all the things that are related to spring, therefore, we must be in spring, and you know what, summer's coming next. And then after that, it's going to be fall. And then after that, it's going to be winter again. And then we're going to start all over. So cycles and the understanding of cycles, the understanding of patterns that repeat is crucial to our being able to predict the future, to plan in the future, and to take advantage of the things that are going to be happening in the future. Pretty basic. And we had talked about that there are short-term cycles and, and individual cycles within us, and that there are broader cycles, uh, even down to the, something like the galactic cycle, which would be how long it takes uh, our sun or any body to rotate all the way around the center of the Milky Way and back to the point where we are right now. So what I want to talk about in this video is the cycle that is at the core of the Ascendant Project. And just before I do that, I just want to uh, have a little discussion about the ideas of description and prescription, because it's, it's very important. The whole point of this project is not to just give you some uh, spiritual or philosophical ideas that are interesting and fun and cool. I mean, I know there's a lot of that out there, but to me, that's never really valuable. For me, the type of knowledge that I want is the type of knowledge that I can use, the type of knowledge that will actually enrich my real waking life every day. And the most important type of knowledge is, of course, the type of knowledge that I can use today to improve my lot in life down the road, whether it's tomorrow, whether it's a year from now, whether it's 10 years from now. And I think for most of us, that's the most valuable type of knowledge as well. So prescription, uh, description and prescription. Now, what do I mean by that? When we encounter a problem or we encounter a situation, we first need to describe the situation. That's the description. And then we can prescribe some actions that we can take or that can be taken in order to get the best result moving forward. That's the prescription. So prescription, we know that in, in medical terms, so I'll use it with a, a sort of a medical analogy and an anecdote. The description in medicine would be a diagnosis. You look at the symptoms, you describe them, and say, okay, this person has uh, developed heavy onset diarrhea, they're losing weight uh, like crazy, they've got sunken eyes, X, Y, Z, 
diagnosis, they've got cholera, prescription, here's what we're going to do about it. Okay? I use cholera as an example because it, it goes directly, there's an anecdote about cholera that goes, that shows in stark terms just how the evolution of a description helps with the prescription. In 1854, in London, there was a cholera outbreak. Now, it was a, an outbreak that was interesting because it appeared to only be clustered in a particular area of the city. Now, cholera is a, a devastating disease. It affects millions of people around the world every year, uh, and it kills hundreds of thousands of people. And the way that it kills you is basically extreme diarrhea, which dehydrates you and can dehydrate you within a matter of hours to the point where you can't rehydrate. And we know that the human body can't go without water for, you know, more than really about a day. And especially when you're being completely water, all the water eliminated out of your body, it can kill people in like 24 hours. So in 1854, here's this cholera cluster and people are just boom, boom, dying left and right. This is serious. So a doctor by the name of John Snow wanted to get to the bottom of this. And he started looking for patterns, patterns of behavior. What were all of the people in this area doing who got cholera? And it was eluding him and eluding him and eluding him until he found someone, a woman who had died of cholera in a completely different area of town where no one else had gotten cholera. Okay, here's, the, here's where the description increases because now he can make a broader description. It's not just people in this area. There's something else I'm going to be able to add to the description. When he went to visit the house where this woman had died, he noticed that he recognized the name on uh, her name as the name on a business in the neighborhood where some people had been dying of cholera. Her last name. When he went to the business owner and asked if there was some connection, he said, oh yes, I'm her son. And after further inquiry, what he found out was that this woman used to live in this neighborhood and loved the water, the taste of the water. New Yorkers are weird about their water. I mean, if you talk about New York pizza, they all say it's because of New York water. Uh, but in this case, we're in London, and she said she loved the taste of the water from the particular water pump that was in that neighborhood. And so her son used to pump water and take it to her every week for her to drink. Boom. It's the water. It's the water. So Dr. Snow went, convinced the city officials, here's, here's what I've got. Here's my description of the problem. My prescription is we got to stop them drinking from that pump. They went to the pump, they took off the pump handle, and the cholera epidemic stopped. Okay. So here we go. We've got description. Drinking infected water or drinking bad water, and it turned out that that particular well that it was pulling from had a sewage leak that was going into it. So there was basically raw sewage going in, which is exactly how you get cholera. But from that initial description, they were able to make a prescription, a very crude prescription. I mean, it, it literally, there was nothing medical involved in it. There was no chemicals. There was no treating patients. It was like, unscrew the pump handle and walk away. It was a very mechanical and crude prescription, but it worked. Now, today, they might not have taken off the pump handle, but they would have known, oh, well, we've obviously got sewage leaking into this well. We need to fix the sewage leak leak. So they had a, a broader description. Now we know a broader description. It's not just water. It's water that has waste. Human waste going into it or animal waste. 
That's a broader description. Then the prescription changes. As the description gets broader, it's not just, oh, it's waste. No, it's the cholera bacteria that's in the waste. Oh, so now antibacterial means. Further, we know it's not just the fact that it's the cholera bacteria itself, but we know that it's the interaction of the cholera bacteria entering into our digestive system, and when it does, it no longer needs uh, the flagella, the little things that it uses to move around, so it starts changing the proteins around in its body, and its waste proteins go from being non-toxic to humans to toxic. And those toxic proteins that are coming out because this thing has changed up how it's using its body cause the diarrhea, which move more uh, of, the, of the cholera bacteria into the waste. That goes, and if that comes into contact now with a healthy human being, they get cholera. If we know that, then we can do even prescriptions where it's like, no, actually what we need is we need a chemical that counteracts that protein. We don't even need to kill off the bacteria. We just need to have a chemical that will uh, counteract what's happening with those toxic proteins that are being shot out by the, uh, by the cholera bacteria. So that's to show how the description and the prescription are related. Our prescriptions are limited by our understanding of the description and the tools that we have available. Because as the tools change, if you've got the, if you've got the flu 100 years ago, the amount of tools available to a physician are very different than what they are now. And so the prescription is very different. So, as we're dealing with cycles and descriptions of cycles, just to understand that a cycle that is described at any given time with the same description can not only have multiple prescriptions, and some of those prescriptions may turn out to be wrong, but over time, that same description will have different prescriptions because in the future, people will have more tools at their disposal. Right? Even at certain times, there may, there may come a time where somebody says, yeah, well, if we only had a technology to do X, then we could actually have this solution. And then eventually that technology might come along and then you use that solution. We've got a political season going on right now. Party politics is usually not about description because they gotta describe reality in a way that's close enough to what people are experiencing for them to actually convince people to go with their prescription. So the left and the right usually describe the same phenomenon, but they each have different prescriptions. And it's which one do you think will work? So I want to talk about the description of a cycle. And I first ran across this description. I was 21 and just out of college, just back in California. I took a little gig as a, a night auditor, but then turned into uh, the general manager of a little tiny kind of motel property near uh, near where I was raised, in the Inland Empire of California. And the owner of this property was a very uh, sort of quirky and funny businessman from India who owned several properties in the U.S. And his mother-in-law, so his wife's mother, was the first female follower of a guru in India by the name of P.R. Sarkar, Prabhat Ranjan Sarkar, who started a group called Ananda Marga in the 1950s. 
It's basically a Hindu sect. Interesting character, not super well known outside of India, but inside India, he is well known as as a, a influential intellectual. He was born in the 1920s, so he was born during a colonial rule, sort of saw the British get expelled, and then India try to figure itself out. In 1950s, he's doing, uh, starting Anand de Marga, writing, talking. It's fun functionally a Hindu sect, but it's a, a little different because he was very secular. And I was introduced to this guy by this Indian businessman who was my boss, who actually became one of my first business mentors. And he gave me a series of books, very difficult to find uh, in the States because they, they were never printed here. Uh, Pierre Sicard died in 1990. And within that book, uh, or within the series of books that he gave me, was this concept that Pierre Sarkar had come up with called progressive utilization theory. He was actually jailed for eight years on trumped up charges because the Indian government thought that this was a pretty dangerous a theory. They thought he might be a communist and was trying to spread something. It's, it's not communism at all. But there was a concept in there. And that concept is a cycle. That cycle, he called the, the human social cycle. And it was based upon the Indian concept or the the hindu the vedic concept called varnas varna means color it's kind of like different colors it, it is used as the hindu class system the indian ancient class system it's actually first mentioned in the oldest hindu text uh, called the rig veda so the Vedas are, I guess, what you would call the, you wouldn't want to use the term Bible, but they are the, the religious texts of Hinduism. And the oldest one is called the Rig Veda, the oldest surviving one. And the Varnas basically have been used for millennia as a class system in India. And they basically go like this. It says there's four different types of people. There's the Shudra, who are the laborers, the common people. The way P.R. Sakar describes it is he said it's the masses. Then you have the Kshatriya. The Kshatriya are the warrior class. In India, these would be policemen, government officials, military. Then you have the Vipra, the Vipra in the uh, traditional caste system is called Brahmin, but it's Vipra in P.R. Sarkar's description of cycle. Now, in, again, this is not a cycle in the traditional Vedic literature. It's just four groups of people that are existing at any given time. It's a social organizational structure. So the Brahmins or Vipra are the thinkers. These are going to be your scientists, your religious leaders, um, your intellectuals. And then the fourth group are the Vaishyas. In Indian society, because it was ancient, these were basically like cattlemen uh, and herders, farmers, merchants. In P.R. Sakar's system, it's fundamentally the merchants. It's the merchant system and a group of merchants. What Sarkar said about these Varnas, and I have, had never heard it before, and I've really never heard it since. And it struck me at that age, and it stuck with me. As he said, basically, these are four energies that exist within all people. Everybody's got a little bit of the masses in them. Everybody's got a little bit of the warrior in them. Everybody's got a little bit of the thinker in them, and everybody's got a little bit of the merchant in them. And whichever more of this sort of archetype and personality a person has, that is the type of person that they are. That is the lifestyle that they go towards. So you would say, look, someone who's an MMA fighter, you might say, well, he's got a high Kshatriyan 
energy in him. Someone who is like a, a biochemist and that's what they've wanted to do all their life. You say, oh, this person's a, got a high Vipra energy. Someone who's a, an economist and interested in finance and, and a stockbroker and, you know, is just constantly obsessed with world markets and the interplay between them. You might say, oh, well, this person's got a high Vaishya energy. And the Shudra energy is an interesting one. And I'm going to go into each one of these as we move forward in the future videos. But I just want to describe the cycle that he talks about because it's incredibly interesting and it makes a lot of sense. Basically what he says is all of these people exist in society, but at any given time, the influence of the mindset of any one of these mindsets is dominant in the society. When it's dominant in the society, that is the mindset of the people who end up ruling and controlling the society. Furthermore, he says, those sequence, the sequence in which different energies and people who have those energies dominate society moves in a predictable path that is very logical and rational, and that's what struck me because it's self-evident, because we see it in our own lives. And he said there are great cycles, and within those there are small cycles. And it basically moves like a four, like a four paradigm game of paper, scissors, rock. To summarize Sarkar, he basically says this. Human society moves in a predictable cycle. Because it's a cycle, it really has no beginning or end. It's a circle. But if you're going to describe the cycle, you've got to start somewhere. So you start with the shudra, the masses. He says the masses is the state of, for instance, the indigenous people. It's the state that people are naturally in. And in this state, people are sort of af afraid of nature. They're moving on a day-to-day -day basis, right? You imagine a tribe of people moving, living in harmony with nature. They're in an almost natural state. The, these are the masses. And again, I'll go into what each one of these, the characteristics of each one of these individuals and then a society that's dominated by that energy as we move forward in future videos. These will be the next videos. He says, among those group of people, naturally, organically, some of those people will have a particular braveness, a courageousness, They'll be able to dominate with their will to dominate nature. So in a tribal society, this might be represented by a man who is a great hunter, right? Who's, who, oh, you have this tribe and they're scared. Oh, there's a lion. And one man stands up, right? The traditional story. How many times have we heard this story down through the ages? You have the scared village the scared tribe, and one man stands up and says, I'll, I'll slay that beast. And he goes out all by himself, right? And he goes and he kills the beast and he comes home triumphant with its skin or its head. And the villagers, oh, you are the greatest, you are the greatest. And they lift him on their shoulders and he becomes their chief or their king. Right? And each of these tribes have that. And now you begin to have a society dominated by the, by the warriors. And then the warriors, when you have societies that are dominated by warriors, what do those warriors do? When they, when they want to gain something, they go after each other. The warriors are fighting the warriors. And the, and the, the shudra, the masses, are kind of like, oh shit, what do I do? Right? They're just at the whim of the kings. And the kings, it's Game of Thrones. The kings are battling each other, battling each other, battling each other. Now, in that society, the strongest is the one that rises to power. But amongst those, there are going to be groups that are not necessarily the strongest, and individuals that are not necessarily the strongest, but they're 
smarter than the strongest. And they develop ways to, they're the advisors to the kings. And how many times have we seen this? Iago in uh, Othello, right? Jafar in Aladdin, <laughs> right? In any story of the king, right? Even in, in Lord of the Rings, right? How do you take over the king? How do you take control of the kingdom without having to fight the king and his armies? With the mind, with manipulation. You manipulate the king. You create uh, intellectual frameworks where you can control his mind. Because if you control his mind, you control his sword. And those are the vibra. And they create religions. And they create philosophies. And the kings, what do we know about Europe? You had the European kings during the Roman time, right? <laughs> Fighting each other. And when the church came along, the church is a vibra thing, subjugates the kings under the church. Right? The true power lies in this thinker who never has had to wield a sword because he wields the power of religion. So you move from Shudra to Kshatriya to Vipra. And then, how do you control the thinkers? How do you control the church? What is the church always in need of? How do you control academia? What are scientists always in need of? Funding. Funding. And how do the central banks control the government's credit? Put them in debt. The understanding that the merchants, the merchants, through the use of, of the power of money and the power of finance and being able to buy the thinkers, being able to bribe the thinkers, what is the problem? The vipra is the politician, right? It's all mental. Everything that he does is mental. Everything the politician is doing is mental. Is he, is he actually hammering in any nails? No. Is he holding a gun and enforcing the laws? No, he's not. He's controlling the military. The president is the commander in chief of the military. Does the president ever actually go? to the battlefield? Is he a general? No! The president we have now never even served in the military. And yet he's in control of the kshatriyas. He's in control of the warriors. He's the head of the warriors, but he's a thinker. Vipra. And then what's the biggest complaint about politicians? In our society, they've been bought. How do you control a politician? With money. The moneyed interest. There's your paper, scissors, rock. The interesting part about this is, I think you can see, now you can walk yourself back through history. If you ha and if you have a basis in history, this cycle is going to make a lot of sense to you. But no matter, you could look at any society and you see that, wow, that's what happens because it's just logical. You can look at any group of human beings and if you start at the masses, you end up, any organization, you end up at Vaisha. You end up at Merchant. And then, this is what's interesting, as a cycle, the next cycle is back to Shudra. Now here's the thing, back to the masses. I'm going to go through each one of these in the next four videos. And then we're going to come a little bit back to the cycle. Because what's important is this. If we know where we are right now, and if we see that the portion of the cycle that we're in is on the decline, then we know if this cycle is true, then we know what's next. We have a description, and we can start to have a prescription 
as individuals who understand the cycle. And let me let you know, people have understood this cycle for a very long time. It's been hidden in plain view. P.R. Sakara wasn't the first person to say it, not by a long shot. It's been said for thousands of years. It's been some knowledge that's been hidden because it's so freaking powerful. But I'm going to point out some other places that it's been right in front of your face. I mean, in Las Vegas, the fact that someone knew this cycle a long time ago is in front of your face pretty much 24-7. As a matter of fact, it's the backbone of the city of Las Vegas. So, the next four videos, I'm going to go into each of the varnas of the cycle, discuss them. And then as we move forward, I'm going to talk about the internal sort of spiritual, individual revelation about how knowledge moves forward and that we have these energies inside of ourselves. I'm also going to talk about how we know what place we're in. And then towards the end of the videos, the end of this video series, what I want to discuss is where I see us moving forward to and my prescription. Pierre Sakara had a prescription but he made this prescription in 1950. And the world in 1950 and the world today is just fundamentally different. Our ability to communicate as human beings and our technological ability, fundamentally different, like it's not even the same world. 1950s may as well be the, the Renaissance or the Dark Ages. So that's what this is. I would love to hear your comments would love to discuss this. Uh, if obviously you could just go look up PR Sarkar, PR uh, as the letters S A R K A R. It's got a Wikipedia page. You could dig further in, uh, and you could see a little bit more about the cycle that he described. Or uh, you could Google Prout, P R O U T. And if you want to discuss any of this or you have any questions, uh, please. It's a conversation. It's a discussion. Comments are off on this video because trolling and whatnot, but if you really want to have a conversation and you really want to discuss, I'm dedicated to having a back and forth with you and explaining any of these thoughts uh, in more detail. You can do that at facebook.com slash vinarmani. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the future discussion.